the global shift towards an intensifying electrification of functions and lifestyles has gathered considerable momentum in past years. It is considered today to be a megatrend of the new century, one that accelerates the energy transition, but also involves some risks. This session explores the limits to mass electrification. How about industrialized and developing countries? And can electricity replace today's heating and cooling technologies? No question, ladies and gentlemen, the commercial availability of a growing range of low emission power generation technologies does put electricity at the forefront of decarbonization efforts. But does that make the future all electric, as is sometimes claimed, or does it overstate electricity's contribution and risk obscuring complexities and trade-offs? Those are some of the questions that we want to explore with four expert guests. And uh, as always, our time frame is quite tight, so I'm going to keep the intros short and also ask all of our speakers to please keep your answers as brief as you can. Two minutes would be very helpful because we really don't have much more than 20 minutes all told for this session. And I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Hems Edina Chitour, the new Minister of Energy Transition and Renewable Energy in Algeria. Also, Professor Claudia Kempfert is with us. She is head of the Department Energy, Transportation and Environment at the renowned German Institute of Economic Research, DIW. Great to see you again, Claudia Kempfert. Alex Chambres is joining us. She is vice president of the Group of Public Affairs and Sustainability at the Global Heating Systems Manufacturer, Fiesmann Group, which is headquartered here in Germany. And I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Alan Finkel, special advisor to the Australian government on low emissions technology, and until last year, chief scientist of Australia. Also great to see you again, Alan Finkel. So let me begin with an overview and uh, ask all of you to help us look at the reality behind the electrification hype. And I'll start out with uh, Minister Shitua, please. And Algeria is, in fact, one of the big African countries, an important natural gas exporter, of course. And it also has enormous potential for solar power production and export of that power. So do you think that by 2050, Algeria could switch its energy model, which heretofore has been based on natural gas, over to one based on solar power and green hydrogen? Thank you. I kindly thank the organizer of the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue for the invitation to the impressive conference. Among many countries around the world, Algeria has proven the, its engagement in an energy transition. The wide diversity of renewable potential of the largest African country give the strong opportunity for Algerian government plan, which is based on the program of Mr. The President to hold an important position for the promotion of energy transition as a necessity and a strategic choice. In parallel, the Algerian model of 50 renewables will gather all the effort to fight against the climate change and to reach in the Paris Agreement goals in 2040. This model is based on the implementation of annual 1000 megawatt capacity from 2021 to reach in the first stage a grid capacity in a green capacity of 30,000 megawatt by 20. 35. Besides the model budget on renewables such as solar and wind energy will not reduce the dependence on fossil in different sectors, but 
also to promote new solutions such electric mobility and green hydrogen. Our Ministry of Energy Transition recently created working hard to implement a sustainable economic policy. In the other hand, we are willing to develop with enthusiasm the partnership with Germany in a field of renewable energy, efficacy and the development of green hydrogen and cooperate in the great field of new ledge of new ledge of in the field of uh, energy transition and research. Thank you. And Claudia, could you give us a brief overview of the status and the trends of electricity usage in industrial and uh, developing countries to help us understand the scale of this great shift uh, to electrification that we're talking about? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Melinda. Great to see you again, and thanks also for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. Just uh, to, br to briefly explain, so the future energy consumption will mainly be electric with only a few exemptions, and renewable electricity indeed is the new oil. If we want to keep the global warming to be limited below it two degrees, the global greenhouse gas emissions must fall to zero as quickly as uh, possible. And that's zero, not uh, net uh, zero. So renewable energy is the only energy that meets all the requirements that is emission-free, low risk, available everywhere and usable today, decentralized and cost effective. And the current nuclear fossil energy system is not compatible with climate goals. It's risky, polluting and expensive. So what we need is a rapid transition to 100% clean, renewable water, wind, storage or renewable energy system uh, for everything, while also addressing uh, the non-energy emissions. So the uh, the transition involves electrification of most everything, that is vehicles, building, heating and cooking and industrial processes and um, that we will talk about here also today. Um, so what we need is an electricity entirely provided with wind, water, um, geothermal and uh, solar. And we estimate that due to the efficiency of the electricity over combustion and other factors, such electrification will reduce worldwide energy needs over 50%. So although overall energy requirements will decline, the electricity requirements will be about 50% greater than today. So the more energy will be electricity. And the biggest challenge in the industrialized countries is to completely decarbonize the economy and implement the energy system shift towards the 100% renewable energy system. And as a fossil nuclear energy system dominates in almost all countries, there is a long way to go. And we are running out of time for climate protection reasons. And renewable energies have many advantages. The costs are continuously decreasing. They are decentralized and can be used everywhere. So solar energy, for example, can be installed on all house roofs, even without a grid connection. This is particularly attractive for developing countries. So renewable energies avoid fossil energy wars and also nuclear weapons and the energy transition uh, based on a 100% renewable energy is the best peace project uh, we have, uh, we have on, on Earth. But um, Green as electricity must be used wherever, wherever possible in the in the mobility sector by strengthening the rail transport, pa public transport, and individual transport, and also in buildings with heat pumps in combination with consistent energy savings. So, electricity first is the motto. Energy, energy uh, saving energy and eliminating energy waste is, is also uh, crucial. And there are only few areas where electricity cannot be used directly. That is heavy transport outside of uh, trolley trucks uh, where green hydrogen or synthetic fuels, that means fuels produced from green electricity will be, will be used. And just as 
for example, shipping and air transport as well, and, and heavy industry, especially the production of steel and metals where uh, coal CHB have to be replaced. And green hydrogen will have to be used there too. But it's really important that we talk about green hydrogen, that it's really green, that is produced with green electricity, because all other colors are either too high in emissions or use unsafe processes such as carbon capture and storage on thus environmental hazards, inefficient, cause high costs or exclude high risks from enormous and expensive technologies such as nuclear. So hydrogen has no role to play in the heating sector or in cars, but hydrogen must be produced with green electricity as it loses a lot of energy in the production and uses process. So hydrogen is not the new oil, so renewable electricity is the new oil. Thanks. Thank you very much. And let me go straight to Alex uh, Chambers. So we just heard there from Claudia Kempfert, yes, uh, the great shift is happening. We're looking at a mostly, if not all, electric future. What does that mean for you in the heating industry? Uh, will that change uh, transition strategies in the building sector? Thank you. So uh, we agree that, there will, that electrification will play a huge role uh, in helping us to reach the net zero targets in buildings. So we will see an increasing electrification of space, of, uh, space heating and heat pump for sure will be the big winner of the energy transition in buildings. Yet to come to the title, panacea or headache. Um, we, we, we are convinced that we need a, a balance, a, 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 a mix of green gas in buildings by 2050 to optimize energy system costs and also um, take the, the people uh, side into account. So let me, let me summarize the three reasons why we believe that uh, green gases will still play a role and must play a role in buildings in a net zero economy. So the first reason is that buildings are extremely heterogeneous and a very hard to abate sector. And one solution does not fill all the di different building types and uh, taste of people and purchasing power. So we need to, to add as many decarbonizing options as possible to meet net zero by 2050. The more options are on the, on the, on the way, the, the higher the likeliness that we meet the target. Another reason is social acceptance. A one size fits all doesn't fit the, the people preferences and people choice and again financial power. And finally, the, the most important reason why we believe that uh, a full, complete electrification of building stock is not the right way, it is the energy system perspective. So we have to remember that uh, space heating, especially in, in Central Europe or, or colder region, is extremely seasonal. And in the winter time, the heat demand will increase um, uh, um, close to threefold or, or more, um, meaning that you, you need to supply this heat demand in, also in the winter time, where often you have no sometimes no wind and often no sun. So there is really this energy security uh, approach to, to have in mind and allowing a share of green gas to coexist in the building stock by 2050, reduce the energy system cost, it reduce the need for, for backup generation capacity, it reduce the, it, it helps us to optimize the size of the electricity grid. And overall, just to take the example of Germany, um, if you take the Dana Light Studio, uh, it was calculated that you could save uh, on a yearly basis 11 billion euros just by allowing um, a smart dose of green gas to coexist next to electricity in 2050. Thank you very much. Let me go over now to uh, Alan Finkel. We have a bit of a debate uh, here so far as to whether uh, green gas and electrification are complements or, in a sense, competitors. Claudia Kempfert telling us that there are some sectors where uh, green gas, uh, green hydrogen, really uh, won't uh, make uh, much of an impact uh, 
And I wonder if you can uh, resolve this or at least where you would cast your vote uh, on this uh, question. What role is hydrogen set to play in Australia's energy transition and how do you see it playing off with uh, electrification? Uh, Melinda, thank you, um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I, I don't have any doubt that it's a false dichotomy to play off electrification against uh, green gas or green hydrogen. We need all the weapons at our disposal in order to ensure the transition. And Australia's been doing that, certainly as, of course, Germany and other countries. But in Australia, we've embarked on a, on a fairly remarkable energy transition uh, beginning with the electricity sector. We see that as the most important place to stay to start, and we've been deploying at record levels of variable renewable electricity, that's solar and wind last year. Approximately 26% of all of our electricity was generated from solar and wind. And we're very pleased with the fact that we now have the highest installed solar generation capacity per person in the world by quite a large margin, and we have the highest percentage of solar rooftops in the world. Um, and we expect this transition in the electricity sector to continue apace. Uh, investors are keen. The commitment to eliminating emissions in the electricity sector, it makes sense because clean electricity will be key to successful decarbonisation decarbonization of the other big sectors, as we've heard, such as transport, building heating and industrial processes. And collectively, the use of fossil fuels today for all of these purposes generates three quarters of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So replacing fossil fuel use with clean electricity and clean hydrogen is the way to start. It's the best return for effort. But even though electricity is almost like magic, it's not always the most convenient way to deliver energy. And sometimes we need a high density fuel. And I would argue that um, the role for hydrogen and its derivatives will be significant in the heavy duty long haul trucks and trains and ships. For Australia and for other countries, the ability to trade renewable energy between the continents in the same way that we have been trading fossil fuel energy between the continents, that ability to trade across the planet will need a, a way to package renewable energy for shipping. And of course, in these cases, the solution is hydrogen and its derivatives, such as clean ammonia. Uh, in 2019, the Australian government released our national hydrogen strategy, and I congratulate Germany for the release of yours last year. Uh, our strategy envisages multiple roles for hydrogen in Australia's energy transition. Domestically, we will use hydrogen for industrial feedstocks and for heating. We'll blend it into the gas networks and we'll use it for long distance heavy duty transport. But of course, as an export, we will build on our willingness to take on huge projects with the aim to become a hydrogen production powerhouse shipping sunshine to the world. We're not stopping there though. You need to use every tool in available. So last year, uh, I had the honor of leading the development of Australia's low emissions technology roadmap. And in that is our first instalment. We have prioritised five low emissions technologies and set financial stretch goals to focus investment by the governments and uh, the private sector to get the cost of these technology down. So one example, clean hydrogen is actually part of the low emissions technology roadmap and we're focused on reducing the cost to under $2 Australian per kilogram, which would be under $1.50 US per kilogram. And hydrogen contributes to other of our five priorities, such as electricity from storage and zero emissions steel. So to finish, let me say it's clear that Australia, we see clean hydrogen as key to the transition to zero emissions across the economy, but as a complement to electrification. And together, clean electricity and clean hydrogen, I think they are the panacea. 
Thank you very much. And I know that Australia is, in fact, involved also in a green hydrogen cooperation with Germany. So many thanks to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are really actually already out of time. This is a very short session. I'd like to ask each of you in one phrase, literally less than 30 seconds each, to tell me what you see as the biggest challenge to this complementarity between electrification and green hydrogen. The, uh, we, you've all said we need to use all the tools in the toolbox. What's the single biggest challenge? One phrase only. Claudia Kempfer. Why well, green electricity is valuable and must be used immediately everywhere it can be used. Hydrogen is the champagne of the energy transition, valuable and expensive and only something for special occasions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Alex Chambers. Yes, so I, we agree that green electricity and green gas, especially hydrogen, are the winning tandem and the panacea, panacea of the energy transition. Mm -hmm. What we would say is the biggest challenge is to secure that the space heaters in, in the EU building stocks and, and global, uh, global building stock are ready for the changing uh, gas mix. And for us, the, ensuring this uh, hydrogen readiness of space heaters is a no regret move. Thank you very much. Alan Finkel, one sentence if you would. For a complex economy, we need to have multiple solutions at our disposal, so we shouldn't pick winners. What we have to do is focus on the emissions of carbon dioxide into, and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere rather than choosing and focusing on favourite technologies. It's emissions that count. Thank you very much to all three of you for this very succinct, very, very interesting exchange. I appreciate you being with us and also your patience uh, with our very short time frame. Many thanks. Music